This is the Hollywood Outsider Weekly Entertainment Podcast, where this week we're going to look at upcoming releases Dark Skies and Snitch. We're going to review reviews of Identity Thief, Top Gun, and IMAX, and the Netflix original series House of Cards. Our From the Outside In topic this week, Rex Reed, he started a firestorm with his recent review of Identity Thief. We're going to talk about what's going too far when reviewing a film, as well as a few things that piss us off. We're going to have the latest in movie and TV news, including our own trivia segments. My name is Aaron Peterson, and with me today are my fellow hoes, Justin McCumber. Am I the only one that when I hear snitch, I yep. just swap out without even thinking about it? One valve. Brian thing. Williams. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? Oh, we'll just we're just trying to move on from Justin before he. Oh, that was a movie title. The I other like, one. Who doesn't yeah. like Brad Pitt? Yeah, Come on. that's right. Thank you. <laughs> and Scott Clark. Hey, how's it going, buddy? Oh, nothing. It's the pornography cast. I think Aaron's this filthy. I didn't mean it. Fil- I'm sorry, America. Or Eastern hey, Texas. There, there might be other countries listening to us. They're, Canada. Well, they, they're really. They're what, the they love us over state. in Burma. Come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Burma. <laughs> they do. They love us over there. We're big in Belgium and Italy. <laughs> oh, I wish we, I want to be big in Russia. That's the rising market right now. Is it? Mm-hmm. For podcasts or just. I, just, I don't know. General. That's what I keep hearing. Russia's. Yeah. Where's that? Russia da. and China. Da. Da. <laughs> Start learning. Start practicing your Dolph Lundgren impression. This is the Russian say. space station. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, this is episode eighty. I don't know if that's really a milestone, but every time we hit a ten, I kind of feel like we did something. Yeah, I don't know what they we have, did. They haven't kicked us off yet. Give, Basically, give all we've done this episode is compare The Rock to a Brad Pitt movie. <laughs> That's I know yesterday I did episode 256, 259 on my own show, so... <sighs> yeah, in case you guys didn't know, Justin has a podcast and he doesn't acknowledge this one as part of his repertoire. Hey, 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 I did an interview for A Minor Magic and the guy who interviewed me asked about this show. Oh, and I look talked at that. quite a bit about this show. So I didn't, I didn't see Hollywood Outside asked. on your business card, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, no, I... No. And I also want to point out. I want to point out that he said somebody asked him about it. He didn't like throw it out there. No, because they know. Because I talk about it a lot on Facebook. So, right. oh. <laughs> um, oh, real quick the the second annual Oscar contest. The subject you want to put on the subject line is "I'm an Oscar hoe." Put that on the subject line when you send in your submission. <laughs> the categories are now listed on the website. So if you want to know which categories participate in and more details, feel free to check that out. Let's jump into movie news. Stephen King's Cell, about a cell phone signal that causes apocalyptic chaos, is filming this May, finally. They've been talking about it for a while. With Paranormal Activity 2 director Todd Williams picked to helm the flick. Yeah, you know, this is really l- Lesser King. Um, of course, even Lesser King is better than most other authors out there able to put out. But when you look at the at all of his work, Cell just is the story that the book that rises anywhere near the top. It's a middling story at best, you know, about the world being plunged into an apocalypse after a mysterious pulse goes out through the world, cell phones, uh, and starts turning people into raving monsters. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see a film adaptation of it as a book. It, it, it was a little longer than the um, story actually probably warranted but near the end of it it started going in some interesting directions bringing on the uh what would you say his name was a uh, todd, todd williams from paranormal activity 2 uh it's probably a good idea um i think his sensibility and the whole um found footage sort of style while that won't be how this one's filmed that kind of handheld frenetic pacing and way the shots are set up are gonna work for cell i i'm i'm curious it's you know, it's a didn't horror we see film this with that, sci-fi. Didn't we, didn't we see yeah, this in that mean, movie, Signal? Well, wasn't it the uh, that Kristen Bell movie? What was it called? Oh, that remake? No, uh-huh. it wasn't a remake. It was a, the, a horror movie she did a couple of years ago. In fact, they actually kind of joked about it. I think it was called Pulse. Yes, Pulse. But that was a remake of a Japanese flick. Oh, was it? Okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they made the story that she said the movie was about in. Um, oh God, I forget what the comedy was. Uh, forgetting Sarah Marshall, they kind of made jokes about that film, and you know where uh, Russell was like, you know, take the batteries out, you know, <laughs> battles over. Uh, yeah, th- this is not a unique idea. It has been done before. I don't know if King's involved in it. In, you know, beyond just 
selling the rights. But eh, I'll, I'll check, you know, it's one of those that's interesting, but, you know, not near the top of my what's going on sort of uh, list. Well, I think it's interesting because Eli Roth originally was supposed to direct it. Mm-hmm. He's backed out, I don't know, two or three times. But you said he's not super talented. I don't like Eli Roth at right. all. No. Um, I like him. Oh, as... this will be starring John Cusack, by the way. I completely forgot to mention that. Sorry. Really? No, that just makes it not good. <laughs> yeah, you don't like Cusack? That's I like right. him before, prior to, t- if this was 2003, I'd be very happy. Yeah. But he hasn't exactly done a whole lot lately to impress me. Here's my thing with Stephen King movies. Shawshank Redemption aside, as far as on his works, mm-hmm. I think his movies have great buildup and great setup, but I always feel disappointed by the end of them. I don't want that in this, especially because I, I find the, the plot kind of intriguing. Uh, you know I thought Pet Cemetery had a pretty goddamn good ending. Yeah, I like, like I said, there's exceptions, but I mean, things like um, uh, The Stand, mm-hmm. and I mean, that was a TV series, obviously, but... Uh, that was actually a book. Storm of the Century. <laughs> Storm of the Century was good. I like Storm of the Century, but I didn't like the ending. Or, uh, but the, that's not so much Stephen King. When he puts it in literary form, it actually works fine. And it's that's fair. The adaptations I haven't, that I haven't read the book, so I, I can't compare it, but... What Justin was saying that this is one of his lesser known or not quite as up to par par books. I'm hoping maybe that will make it a more satisfying, more of a Hollywood ending than than what I'm. Than I just hope they to. shoot the little kid at the end. That's all I hope for. <laughs> the Mist. <laughs> Robert Downey Jr. has picked up the rights to an episode of the British TV series Black Mirror. It's about a a man who gets an implant that allows him to rewind and play, replay events. Didn't they call yeah, it so like- <laughs> Adam Sandler. <laughs> So this is, I mean, so from what I gather, this is basically they they he just took the rights from one episode of this TV show. Yeah, one episode. So hey, we like we we don't care about the rest of it, but we just like this one. Apparently, is it every a Twilight other... Zone type of show. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, and that would make yeah, kind of, sense. Right, right. It's kind of an anthology type of thing, but you know, Robert Downey Jr. has really got nothing to do with it other other than his production company. Well, they haven't said yet. No, <clears throat> no, it, it said that he's not. Acting in it. As of yet. They haven't started casting or anything. He's just picked up the rights. I wouldn't be surprised if he hopped in. Yeah, I wouldn't either. What else, I mean, what else he's, is he He's looking for it? something pro or post Iron Man and Sherlock Holmes. That's all he's done for the last few years. Does he need to do anything else? Uh, I, th- I think he's a type of thespian that would like to. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, he's going to be doing Iron Man and Avengers 2, and I think he's going to be pretty busy with that one. Are, you, are they actually going to do a third... Um... Sherlock Holmes movie? <clears throat> yeah, they're working on a story right now. They better, or I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> I'm invested. I want a trilogy. I want a trilogy of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Albert Bro- Oh, this is... I don't know what to think. Albert Brooks and Ellen DeGeneres are both back for Finding Nemo 2. Is it too late, Scotty? You guys know I love Pixar movies and I love Finding Nemo, but I think it's too late. That was 2003. That was 10 years ago, as of now. Thank you. And the... <laughs> What made those movies, that movie and another one we're going to talk about later, was the novelty of it, the newness of it. Were we going to find Nemo again? Is he going to, is he going to be lost? I just, I don't know. I, I, think it was, that I, bitch. I think it was just the fact that it was, at the time, it was a beautiful cartoon. Mm-hmm. It's still and a beautiful cartoon. It is. Right, but how many beautiful cartoons have we seen since then? Right. It's not, right. it's not, I mean, it's. That was kind of the novelty of it. Now it's just, I mean, it was funny. It was entertaining. And I've still got running jokes with a couple of friends from some of the stuff from that movie. But it was, it's, it's time as that window is shut for us, you know, for a follow up movie. And, and it, it, we're seeing this a lot as well. Like, like Cars did it, right? And, but it's yep. also hard to argue the numbers because, like, Cars did, Cars one did what, like about a quarter of a million. Cars two did just under 200,000. So mm-hmm. they're going to keep doing it. Two hundred million, not two hundred thousand. Sorry, two hundred million. Because that would be what's known as a flop. Yeah, that. My bad. Pixar might lose it. Might go out of business for that. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see. I mean, they're going to keep making. I'm really surprised that they went this route. I mean, we're going to talk about Monsters University a little bit later, but they're making sequels to shit nobody wants to see sequels to. I think so. I, I was really shocked they made a Cars two. I, I didn't see it. Did you see it? No, I didn't like Cars one. I didn't either. That was like one at the bottom of the totem pole for me, and that was the one I, I made a sequel. I saw Cars too. It was, it was all right. Yeah, but I mean, I but I liked I liked the first Cars. So well, I'm sure you did. Mater's in it. <laughs> 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 Sony Pictures is planning an adventurous twist 
on Oliver Twist called Dodge and Twist. That's three twists, way too many. Uh, where Twist and Artful Dodger are on opposite sides of the law, going after the crown jewels. It's always interesting when someone is going to take um, a beloved story, you know, like what Charles Dickens wrote with Oliver Twist, and take it beyond what Charles Dickens actually wrote. Uh, you're, you're always kind of stepping out onto hollowed ground, and it's you have to be careful because there are a lot of people who love Oliver Twist. It has been beloved for God. I mean, how, when was that story first published uh, over a hundred years ago? Um, so there's a lot of, and it's been in play form, movie form, almost everybody, even if you don't know the actual story, there are parts of it that are just a part of our culture. So then to suddenly come in, take those characters and then do something with them beyond what we know is it it's a little bit strange uh of course charles dickens has been dead for a long time so they can't dig him up and get his permission for any of it but i am curious though to awesome. see where they're <laughs> yeah <laughs> hit him with a little uh um Voodoo resident med. evil juice and mm. <laughs> see what he got to say but you know they're going to take the characters of oliver twist and the artful dodger uh move them forward 20 years and have a new adventure where these guys are on opposite sides of the law and uh embroiled in an affair to steal the crown jewels it's an interesting idea and i'm actually curious to see how they're going to handle it who they're going to cast in these roles it has a potential to be really fun and i think these characters are yeah, I wouldn't say perfect for this kind of thing, but they're they're certainly um, interesting enough, and I want to see what they do with it. Um, I don't know. I'm not that cl so close to Oliver Twist that it's um, sacrosanct. Uh, for other people, I'm sure it is, and, and they won't see it, but uh, I would like to see where they take it, who they hire, how they handle it. It's It has a lot of potential. I think it's it'll just... be It'll be Jeremy Renner and Daniel Day Kim. <laughs> <laughs> did he just make a lost reference he did yeah no i didn't i made a i made a hawaii hawaii 5 reference oh i okay well on Itch. one hand i think you know they did it with sherlock holmes you know taking an old old property and, and modernizing it but the difference is is that with sherlock holmes it's this it's still in that time period you know, you're, you're just kind of giving it a new look and giving it some freshness. And this one, you're going 20 years in the future with characters that are 20 years older and mm -hmm. completely doing something completely different. I think it's going to be more based on that than it is the actual fiction or the lore of Oliver Twist. I don't know if that'll work. I, I just think it's 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 an odd take on a real classic premise. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how I feel about it. I really don't. Yeah, I'm I mean, it's, it sounds interesting, but if if it's handled right, if they handled it, like they handled Sherlock Holmes, for example. But whenever you put this kind of modern twist on stuff, I mean, it just half a dozen women. I mean, there's a good chance it's going to suck balls, mm -hmm. and there's a good chance it's going to be great. So it really depends on how who gets it. I'll say more power to them. Cut yeah. it up, change it up. If you can do something like The Wiz, then you can get away with something like this. Yeah, but The Wiz wasn't good, was it? Did anybody get away with The Wiz, really? I mean, it was somebody got away with, with pitching it. Because they, because they got it, they got it made. Well, just because it got made and doesn't mean it was, it was quality though. I mean, that was a musical. That's with, my point. Was it... I'm not saying that is good, but they. Oh, okay. If you can do that and even do a shitty job with it, then you should be able to get this one done and have a pretty good shot at making a decent movie. All right. <laughs> I just don't want them to get too slick with it, and that's one of the things that I, I haven't liked about the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies. I feel like they get just a little too slick with the the way they're they're shooting those movies with a lot of the slow motion stuff. It those movies are period pieces that as soon as they start adding in a lot of modern sensibilities with the camera, it kind of pulls me out of that period ness, if that makes any sense. I don't want them to do that with this. I'd much prefer a more kind of straightforward approach to whatever sorts of heist shenanigans they get up to. Yeah, I know what you mean. I had the same problem with Gangster Squad, if you remember when I talked about that. Like the slow motion, you almost expect doves to come out mm -hmm. and didn't fit in the period. <laughs> yeah. That would be fantastic. I would run out and see that right now. <laughs> like brought to you by John Woo. Yeah. 
<laughs> Batman, well, more Batman news, might not be rebooted until 2017 because they were talking about it pretty closely. But most importantly, the Justice League film looks to be back on the drawing board as the script was apparently shit. Yeah, apparently there's there's really kind of a couple of things going on here. Apparently, like I say, the uh, Justice League is apparently dead. And there's one report that says that Justice League is basically dead in the water until because of a terrible script. So uh, there's that going for it. But they're also kind of playing this waiting game with the Man of Steel movie because it's almost like a, a line of dominoes. And it all depends on this first domino being the Superman movie because if it goes well, then more than likely Superman gets a trilogy and then they'll, they're also trying to get the justice league movie to release around 2015. And, uh, if that happens, and of course, if all of this is going well, then they're probably targeting Batman to release around 2017, maybe even as late as 19, because by that time the trilogy will be over and basically kind of will be far enough removed from the dark Knight trilogy that, this one should probably do well standing on its own and not be so close and worried about being compared to Christopher Nolan's uh, little masterpiece. So, hmm. Does I don't anybody know. really think that super, the Superman movie is going to not be great? Uh, the last one. Did never... you see the last one? Yeah. It didn't did... do very well, man. I mean, it did okay. It did like 400 million, I think, worldwide. But right, they but... wanted to do half a billion easy. So, yeah. yeah, this is, I mean, they're, they're, this has to be big enough to where you're just, you're not creating just one franchise with this. You're you're basically creating about two or three different franchises with it. Mm-hmm. So it, it has to be big. Superman has to be Spider-Man level. It, it can't be Green Lantern or, or anything like that. It has to be a mega hit. I'm thinking more along the, like the lines of Dark Knight instead of... Dark Knight made um, a half a billion dollars just in America. No, no, no. I'm talking about as far as rebooting it to, to that tone. Like Spider-Man was more tongue-in-cheek comic booky. Mm-hmm. Whereas, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, I mean, we're not talking tones. We're just talking dollar bills. Yeah. This, dollar, dollar, this, dollar bills, dollar y'all. Bills, y'all. Sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> y'all so gang stuff? <laughs> Look, I, everybody wants to see the Justice League movie, it seems like. But if the script is shit, delay it. Just delay it. There's no reason to rush it. I, I think they're trying too hard to, to come to grips with Avengers or stealing all of their comic book movie Thunder. They need to wait. I think they should wait until 2016 to even have that movie out because Avengers comes out the same year as 2000. I think it's 2015 or are they 14. I can't remember anymore. 15. Yeah. Yeah. 15. <clears throat> so they need to separate themselves. If they come out with justice League the same year as Avengers two, they're going to be seen as a total ripoff. Mm-hmm. I just think it's, they, it's they bad need for them. to get in conjunction with Marvel and say, look here, here's what, here, let, let us see what your tentative schedule is for the next 10 years with these movies. Let us plan it for your gaps. So if they've got Avengers 2 coming out in 2015, like you say, hey, let us have 16. You have one of your secondary characters, Captain America 4, whatever the case is. <laughs> and then, you know, you can do those, but the big the big ones, the JLA or the Avengers, let them, you know, stagger. Them. So say, hey, look, we concede you're bigger, probably better, but... Let's, you know, we don't want to step on each other's toes here. Let us give us a year that you're not doing something really big <laughs> and let us have it. I don't see Marvel helping. I don't out. think Marvel's going to help them with that no. shit. No. Anything that they do. I that. think they're like, give us Batman. We'll do it right. I would see that well, before. Yeah. <laughs> DC. Well, 2015 is already packed with the Avengers 2 and the, in that new episode 7 supposed to be coming out that mm-hmm. year as well. Yeah, it sounds like a popular year. And I'm telling you, it's bad for it's bad news to put a movie that's so similar right next to it. Because Justice League, for a lot of the kids today that don't know these characters, and then we've had this debate and I don't want to have it again. I'm just saying for a lot of the today's young people mm-hmm. that don't really know the Justice League characters, they're going to think it's just a ripoff of Marvel. Because they're not going to have all those initial movies to introduce you to all the characters. I don't think you're even remotely close to being right, but... Fair enough. Welcome to Brian's Trailer Park. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, first up is a documentary, and, you know, we really don't do too many of these in this segment, but it's called The the Unbelievers, uh, which is about a couple of scientists on a mission to explain the importance of science and how it relates to the modern world. 
oh, and apparently disprove religion at the same time. Hmm. So this topic really can spur on a discussion with this group that would last for quite a while. But is this something you would really pay money to see in the theater, Justin? No, I mean, documentaries just aren't something that I need to go to a theater and, and see. I, I, I did watch the trailer. I'm interested in this one as someone who is practically an atheist. <laughs> practically? Uh, and, How are you anything but? It's too complicated to go into. <laughs> Suffice it to say, more often than not in arguments, I, I side with the people of reason and intelligence, which is invariably going to be the atheists and, and not the believers of the purple tentacle monsters flying in the sky or whatever your belief happens to be. I respect but, you, Christians. It's okay. Huh? I said I respect you, Christians. I think it's all okay. of y'all are nuts. It doesn't matter what <laughs> what denomination or, or hat you wear. It, it's all crazy bullshit. But it's an interesting film. Um, I, I do want to see it, but it's not something I need to go to a theater to see. I, I much prefer a documentary uh, on the comfort of my couch. I feel the same way. And, and, I, and while I do think this could be interesting. I think it's a lost cause, this kind of thing. You're not going to convert anybody with this kind of movie. You're going to make those that – you're not going to sway anybody either way, which is kind of the point of a documentary. You know, you want controversy. I, I don't agree with that. I don't think it's just – I don't think it's there to sway anyone's opinion. I think they're trying to get people to just think, to think. And this was suggested by a, a listener, Travis M., by the way, so I want to make sure we mention him. That's fine. Um I think documentaries are meant to provoke thought and provoke conversation, provoke conversation. And that's what I think this is doing. I don't think it handles it the way Bill Maher did, which was funny, but sure. cruel. I th- Well, harsh toward mm-hmm. people that he didn't agree with. They seem to be, hey, look, you know, we don't agree with, with the religious front. Here's what we think. Here's why we think it. See, I, I, I put it in your don't life. agree with that. I think it's a religion bashing movie. I didn't see that in the trailer. I'm really? not saying that's not true. I just didn't see it in the trailer. It hugs the line a little bit. It, I think it's nothing. But I mean, they even made the comment. Now, of course, they don't give you the answer. But at the beginning of it, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, he he asked, "Are you are you promoting science or hating on religion?" And of course, boom! It's a dramatic cut. He doesn't give him. You know, the preview doesn't let him answer it. Of course, you got to see the movie to mm-hmm. get his answer. But you know some of the people. You know some of the people in this is Sarah Silverman, uh, Ricky Gervais, and a lot of these comedians that are that are. I mean, just outwardly, atheists. you know, ba- atheists. Yeah, mm-hmm. bash religion. If you're if you believe in anything at all about the Bible, you're a you're a fucking idiot. So it's pretty one sided. I'm curious about it. I'll but I'll probably will wait till Netflix or something like that. Yeah. Now, see, I, I do believe in purple flying people eaters, and I didn't get that from the trailers. I, I thought it was interesting, but I'm also pretty open to this conversation. I, I think religious is hysterical, even though I think 90% of it is crap. Um, but it's funny to me, and, and it makes me laugh, and Bill Maher makes me laugh. But to your point, you said that these, the point of these movies is to make people think. It is. And and people... you know, when I saw religious, I started talking about it. No, and I people. understand, but the majority of people— Are you people... talking about religious? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But the majority of the people that the people, the makers of this documentary want to see to make them think mm-hmm. aren't going to think open mindedly. That's probably true. That's fair. They're, they're That's trained. Fair. They're, He's ca- yeah. They're, they're basically. Don't say trained. Who- That's how you get people fighting. Okay. They <laughs> are conditioned the to believe that, the that bottom line is faith. There, if there, there's, it doesn't matter what. What science says, it doesn't matter what anything says. I believe this, and that's that is my rock, is my faith. Right. You're not going to see it, touch it, feel it, smell it, but I know. That's mm-hmm. the end of their argument, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it's bad. You're, <laughs> you are you're not going to tap into those people. You're not going to. All this is going to do is fuel those that are already atheists or agnostics or whatever. You're adding more fuel to their fire. Fire, and again, I'm not saying that's bad or good either. So. Well, then you know what I want to see is I want to see something that, that really approaches the subject and treats it from a, with, a fair, with a fair sword, mm-hmm. both sides. You know, that's what I want to see, that documentary. That's, of course, nobody will want to see it because it's not. You don't have anybody that's unbiased. That's the problem. Well, I, would, I don't agree with that. I think there's people out there. I Put two filmmakers, put an atheist and, and a religious sect uh, director together and have them split the movie or something and combine different ideals. I think that would be a fantastic movie. 
It'd be very intriguing and get people talking. I don't care how fired up they get. I don't know what formula I want. I want something along the lines of what you're saying, but I think doing that isn't going to work because it's just going to be a back and forth. And you're not going to find two people that are that passionate about the subject that are unbiased enough to bring an open-minded opinion. All right. Let's go on to Monsters University because we know those are real. <laughs> <laughs> well, just so you know, uh, no release date has been set yet, but sometime uh, – Later on this year, the unbelievers should roll out. But on a lighter note, some people get good at their jobs by learning on the job or becoming a self-made man, so to speak. But how did Mike and Sully become a couple of the scariest monsters lurking in kids' closets? Well, just ask Aaron. He's a pro. <laughs> <laughs> but, they, but they went to Monsters University, which not coincidentally is the title of our next movie. And... It's basically a prequel about the early days of Mike and Sully and their not so always chummy friendship back in their uh, college days. So it does bring back the original voices, Billy Crystal, John Goodman. Um, but I know Scott Pete has bed quite a bit from fright. So uh, <laughs> 14 days dry are we now? But <laughs> what do you have a, a little meter for a little? Yeah, he's, he flips a little. He's, you know, it's like a you know, like on a job site, they flipped a little number. Uh -huh. you know? So many days accident free. Oh, yep. it's an Apple device. IP. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're welcome. Copyright oh. it. Add it to the iWatch. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Scott, you want to see this one? I went into this trailer ex really excited because I love Monsters Inc. And I was really. I I love the original Monsters Inc. Right. I thought it was great. It was it made me laugh. I've watched it on TV every once in a while, and it's it great. Overrated, but overrated, but okay. Uh, this is a this is a movie that should have been a sh one of the shorts before another Pixar movie, a new property. Th this made a funny trailer. Not, a, not I, I was disappointed in the trailer. A couple minor laughs, but no, I'm I'm really not super I, stoked. I'm for starting this. to think Pixar is jumping the shark. I think so too. Honestly, I liked Brave a lot. But what they what they have in coming down the pike um, <laughs> is not impressing me at all. And mm -hmm. this, I thought the original was very overrated. I did not think it was fun, me personally. Um, it's probably one of you know, I, I just really don't like it. And to see a sequel for this does not excite me. There's nothing I found funny in the entire trailer. I did find the, Chris, the uh, disco ball joke pretty funny. Yeah, me too. But that was like the teaser trailer. That wasn't even in this trailer. This was a lot of slapstick way more slapstick than even the the other one. I, I just I can't get excited about it. I want to see more new properties from Pixar that aren't just another Disney fairy tale like kind of like Brave was. Although I I did watch Brave a second time and liked it a lot better than I I love I, Brave. Yeah, I that was that was great. But I want I want more new clever things like that. Mm -hmm. Not not sequels. Yeah, I have to completely agree with Scotty. I, I think this would be it would be interesting as a short before the movie, you know, that you actually went to go see. I'm not interested in this at all. I think Monsters, Inc. is fairly middling Pixar. It's it's not bad. It's not great. It's just kind of there in the middle filling out the roster. Um, but, yeah, they're, Pixar is doing so many sequels. It's like they're... Their parent company of Disney is just really infecting them with that whole sequelitis mentality. You know, as soon as you get something popular, start cranking out the sequels. And I could, un I understood it with Cars too, because Cars hadn't been out that long. So that sequel, you know, the amount of time between one and two wasn't that long. But shit, when did Monsters, uh, Monsters Inc. come out? 2001. Yeah, so you're talking 12 fucking years ago. This, If you wanted to do this film, you should have done it 10 years ago, 9 years ago. To do it now, just it, it seems like we're bored. We really don't have any ideas, so let's just crank out a sequel to to this one. Guys, if you're going to do a sequel, give me a fuck another uh, The Incredibles. Mm -hmm. At least that was an interesting film that could use a sequel there there are yep. all sorts of shenanigans that the incredibles could have gotten up to who gives a shit about these monsters in college i guarantee you they're not gonna be doing what real college kids doing hooking up and sh hitting the bong <laughs> they ain't doing it in this movie so how fantastic would that be if you see what is it what are their names sully and mike sully's just hitting oh, the, hitting the yes. crack pipe turn in the mike into a into a bong <laughs> <laughs> Knock his eye out and use that as. Yes. Oh wow! 
Mm. All right. Well, Monsters University opens on June 21st later on this year. And I want to see Justin's version of that movie. I, I'll go see that in the theater. <laughs> yeah, just wait for the Red Band trailer. Awesome. The Red Band trailer of Pixar movie. Uh, well, you guys can uh, watch these trailers and those from recent episodes at thehollywoodoutsider.com. And if you've uh, got any questions or any topic ideas that you want us to chat about, you can reach us on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Uh, you can also get us on facebook.com forward slash the Hollywood Outsider, or you can email us at feedback at the Hollywood Outsider.com. And don't forget, you can still get your I'm a Ho t shirts at the Hollywood Outsider.com. Stump. God damn it. God damn it. God damn it. You can't say it. You don't believe in him. Oh, I'm damning him. I can, <laughs> no, I can say it. You're going to get us thrown off the internet. No, because what you're saying is you want God to damn whatever topic you're talking about. So therefore, you do believe in him. You're not damning God. That's <laughs> damn God. So that that way you're right. But if you say God damn it, God damn the <laughs> article, whatever the case is. I and hope somebody's was- playing us in a church right now. <laughs> and that was the last time we heard from Brian. <laughs> <laughs> fuck, 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 fuck. All right, let's go. There you go. Lightning right through the trailer. Stump the hoe. <laughs> Stump the Ho. Each week, one of our hosts poses a trivia question to the remaining hosts and attempt to stump their fellow hoes. This week, it's Justin Sturm. Justin, what's your question? All right, well, earlier we talked about Stephen King. Uh, the guy is, without doubt, my favorite writer of all time. And when it comes to movie adaptations, he easily has to hold the record for the most number of works that have been adapted either into television or movie form. When you look at his IMDb page, it is just chock-a-block with things that he's credited as writing, producing, even acting in. But there is only one project in which he's credited as being part of the soundtrack. Which one is it? A, Stand By Me, B, Golden Years, C, Christine, or D, The Stand? Aaron? What were the options again? A, Stand By Me, B, Golden Years, C, Christine, D, The Stand? Uh, I'm going to go with The Golden Years. Okay, Scotty? Well, I was going to go to the golden years, but I'll be accused of stealing his answer. So I'll say, oh, screw it. I'll go with the golden years. Okay. So that's and a Brian? I've never heard of. You're stealing my answer. <laughs> golden years was actually quite good. I enjoyed it. It was. Brian? It was, it was sweet. I'm going to go with, God, I'm torn between two and golden years is not even one of them. Well, then don't pick it, fucker. Let's go. God damn it. I'll go with Christine. All right. And the answer is D, The Damn. Stand. That was the you are was... all wrong. Oh, really? In The Stand, there is a character who is a musician. And in the, in the book, yep. he wrote several lyrics for songs. In the show, they had those songs made into actual songs. So he is credited as the writer. Bonus question. <laughs> Oh, and this God, is not multiple of... choice. Okay. He also is credited as directing one movie. Maximum Overdrive. There you go. All right. That's fuck you. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now let's go to the big screen. Well, this week, the biggest release was Identity Thief. See what I did there? That'll come, that'll come up later. Um, Jason Bateman stars as Sandy Patterson. He's an accountant who takes a job as a VP at a new startup firm until his rapidly declining credit and outstanding warrants put his job in jeopardy. And he finds out Diana, played by bridesmaids Melissa McCarthy, stole his identity and ruined his life and future. Because apparently that happens. Don't do it, people. Don't do it. After the government essentially tells him that they don't chase down identity thieves, Sandy only has one choice, and that is to persuade Diana to come back to Denver from Florida and clear his name. That's where hijinks ensue. He finds Diana, talks her into coming back, tries to elude criminals like T.I. and Robert Patrick, <laughs> and get her back in time to keep his job. Um, the story, this is a one joke movie. I mean, we've talked about it a couple weeks ago. Everything I told you is exactly what propels every joke. There's really not a whole lot of original material. It comes down basically to the two leads and what they're going through. Did you say T.I.? T.I., the it, rapper. Is in Rubber Band Man? Really? You don't he know? He ain't no RZA. <laughs> <You don't... laughs> uh, the one major complaint I have about the film is that the hitman going after Diana is completely pointless. And as, t- as far as the story goes, it's not funny, and it should have been cut from the movie. And a, and a good quality director would have seen that. 
it's pointless. You can totally pull that out of the movie, and the movie would be very good. <laughs> um, Robert Patrick and T.I. are fine, but they add absolutely nothing to the story whatsoever, and they make the film drag every single time it starts to pick up speed. As far as the acting, Jason Bateman, he's exactly who he is in every single movie he's in. He's the same guy. So pick him out of Horrible Bosses or whatever you want to pick him out of and put him in with this. Same guy. But he's great at that part. That's what he does good now. Uh, he's, he's the a, Grant of comedy. He is. Yeah. He's very much, yeah. <laughs> he's a sensible, good guy. He's got clever jokes. He's just trying to do the right thing. Like a subdued Steve Martin is what I'd call him. Uh, Melissa McCarthy, I mean, this is who the film is really shot around. I mean, that's what the movie's about. The woman is funny. She can make the most crude thing pretty hilarious. When she talks about to a little kid about her sweet junk, I, I couldn't stop laughing. I mean, that shit is just funny. Um, one thing I want to point out, though, is even though I think the movie is, is way too long and it's a little too average, the two leads are both very strong, and both of them have a couple of real heartfelt scenes, which was really surprising to me. And, and they both show off. They're really talented. If they would just get the material, that would let them do that. I would really like to see Melissa McCarthy do something very serious. Hmm. I think she would. She really moved me. There's a couple of scenes where I was actually moved. In a stupid ass comedy like this, uh, directing it's a road trip comedy. It's not rocket science. Seth Gordon directed Horrible Bosses. He's directing this, and he continues to not know when a plot thread should be trimmed. Uh, the guy is not a great comedy director. He he's got some great scenes, but the fact that he left all that shit in with the hitman and everything that were, were not it was just not funny and totally irrelevant really when it came down to the scope of everything. So overall, I thought the film had a lot of good fun. Some laughs. Uh, there's a couple of hysterical scenes. The, the two leads are both great. McCarthy just punched herself a golden ticket. I mean, she's going to have a great year. In the throat? Did she throw? Oh, you fucker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad somebody made it. But it's simply way too long. It really is way too long. And too much of that, the stupid hitman subplot. So out of $10, that's the full price of mission. I give it five bucks. Hmm. Now, if they had taken out the Hitman shit, what would you give it? I would have gave it about an eight. I mean, the stuff without... Damn, that's really that bad? It, it, it's completely stupid. Absolutely stupid. It, it It's one of those... You remember those like 80s, 90s comedies where you always had like two people that were embroiled in a bunch of stuff, and then there's always that stupid crime subplot? Mm-hmm. It's it's that. It's that kind of It's that kind of idiocy. It's just irrelevant to the movie. If they would have stuck with him going to get her and try to bring her back and they go through a couple of really crazy scenarios, like a plane, strains, and automobiles thing, this would have been really funny. Because mm-hmm. when it's just those two, really funny. Every time the other people come into play, really stupid. Hmm. That's too bad. It That's was too, too bad. bad. Um, Top Gun, Scotty. Yes. What do you think? We went and saw Top Gun in IMAX and 3D. Scotty and I and, and our buddy Tyler, we went, we wore our aviator shades, we wore mm-hmm. tank tops. And we wore dog tags. We did. And we watched the most homoerotic movie ever made in the history of cinema. And didn't get nearly as many funny looks as I expected. I was kind of disappointed. No, people weren't even flinching, really. It's winter. I know. They're just like, hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> you seem like you fit right in. Yeah. I, I haven't seen the movie in a couple of years, and, and uh, I was looking forward to it. The As far as the the high definition and the, and the IMAX and the 3D... The close-up shots of the guys in the in the cockpits, I thought looked fantastic. I, I kind of had the same thing though, with, mm-hmm. like with Raiders of the Lost Ark. The close-up shots looked great. The stuff in the background, I just I just don't either they can't fix it or they won't. It it just still looks oh, man. super grainy. The some of the shots, like the the, I mean, Justin, you'll appreciate it. The real stereotypical Tony shot, Tony Scott shots, where they're uh, it's just kind of like gritty looking and and looks really like the opening edgy intro. for the time. The opening intro. Looks mm-hmm. really awful mm-hmm. in IMAX. Mm. It really does. It, it just doesn't hold up. Looks great on Blu-ray or whatever, but it just does not hold up in the theater. Uh, I still had a lot of fun though. Oh, it I was mean, a blast. Th- it's it's so fun to see. I mean, you see Maverick and Goose and Iceman and Val Kilmer when he's about seventy-five hundred pounds lighter, right. um, and he's not acting with Fifty Cent. I mean, he was such <laughs> a good actor at that time. And and Tom Cruise looks the same. I, I don't know. I mean, he's got like four more wrinkles. And that's it. <laughs> I, I will say, and, and I've, I've thought this even when I saw it years ago, the the silhouetted love scenes are really awkward. Yeah, I felt dirty. It, it I don't know. You shouldn't see somebody's tongue that much. <laughs> no, it looked like they're eating nachos. It really, did. especially in IMAX, and they close up every time they kiss. It looks like they're eating nachos. Maybe it was because IMAX, but it, it was a lot clearer and that kind of thing. But it, I 
I was squirming in my seat a little and bit. Kelly McGillis is not attractive. She's really not. And a really big screen, she's even less attractive. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. diving into her pores. <laughs> <laughs> she's got a man face. She's got a man face. But but the action stuff, what you really go to see that movie for, was was great. Yeah, when they had the plane, uh, the normal plane scenes and whatnot, the sound, the sound amped especially. up. You know, however IMAX does it. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. And it is the most homoerotic film I think I've ever seen. I didn't realize how much until I'm sitting there with three guys in our tank tops and all the scenes are planned. <laughs> <laughs> and you get – there's actually one scene after – after spoiler alert, Goose dies. And uh, Tom Cruise is sitting there looking in the mirror in his underwear, his whitey tidies, for no reason whatsoever. Viper comes in, Tom Skerritt. And as he's walking out, he's like, hey, his hand lingers get over it, get over it, or, whatever, or walk it off, whatever he says. And his hand brushes across his back. It is the longest back brush of a naked man I've ever seen in my life. It uh, so when Val Kilmer stands there, you know, doing that whole, in, you it's know, breathe flying, in and Maverick. out shit. Ugh, it's your man. attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Oh, that's funny. You mean when he struts across the floor in his towel? Yes. That, that, that weird posture that he's like strutting. <laughs> that was so awkward. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, we felt a lot less straight when we walked out, but that's all right. <laughs> Justin, you saw Silent Hill Revelations. Yeah, I did. I I bought it yesterday. It's so it's one of those movies that I don't mind going out and buying. I'm a genre fan. So, well, I'm trying to pare back my collection a bit. Uh those sorts of movies are are always going to uh going to be in it. I I can't get rid of them. Um but yes, yeah, so I went out and I bought Silent Hill Revelations and I was prepared for the worst. And or actually, it's Revelation. No S on that. I, I keep stumbling over that too. Um, I expected to hate it, and pretty much figured that I would. But I came away actually enjoying it. Uh, it's it's not a great film, and really, by all rights, I shouldn't have enjoyed it nearly as much as I did. And I put almost all of the success of this movie on the cute shoulders of Adelaide Clemens, who plays Heather. Uh, slash Alessa in the film. I think she does just an incredible job of giving a believable performance surrounded by all of these unbelievable things. And she really keeps this movie going. She, she has it completely in her hands. I loved seeing her from beginning to end. And I was so glad that they actually explained the the things that happened between the first film's ending and this one, because I was really confused how she's there with Sean Bean and he's got a different name, but they explain it. It makes sense. And I, I'm really kind of curious to see where they go with it next. It's not a great film, but damn, I actually really enjoyed it. Oh, that's good to hear, actually. The but- extras, though amount to the trailer and three and a half minutes of everybody just sitting around talking about oh i thought it was a pretty good movie and that's <laughs> it if, you, if that's all you're gonna do then don't fucking bother it was a huge that's, flop man it didn't make any money so they probably didn't want don't bother with even that three minute bullshit don't tease me with extras and that's what i find <laughs> scotty we you and i both saw flight Real quick, what was Flight about? Uh, Den, uh, this is Denzel Washington movie. He plays uh, Whip Whitaker. That's this guy's actual name. Say that three times real Whip fast. Whitaker, Whip Whitaker, Whip Whitaker. All right. Uh, he's an airline pilot who uh, he pulls a miraculous landing of a disabled plane and saves the lives of several people in the process. But later on, the authorities uh, begin to raise some questions. His toxology report shows that he was drunk and high on cocaine while piloting the plane. So they're looking for a scapegoat, basically, for a, the, the few deaths that did take place. And along the way, Whitaker struggles with his uh, addiction while attempting to uh, to clear his name and stay out of prison. I kind of knew pretty much what was going to happen in this movie from the beginning, but uh, I went into it with an open mind. What did you think about it, Aaron? I thought Denzel Washington's amazing. Mm-hmm. Honestly, it, he was he was really amazing. Even as a coked out alcoholic, I still want to hang out with the guy. <laughs> I mean, he's he's just that good. There's a reason he got nominated for an Oscar for the role. But the movie's way too long. I mean, way yep. too long. It's, I think, two hours and 20 minutes or something mm-hmm. like that. Could have cut 40 minutes off it easy. I mean, I, I agree. I, I just, trim it back, it would have been a great movie. It's just it's just a good movie. They had that whole side plot with, with the former heroin addict, the the girl. Yeah, there's a subplot <laughs> where there's a, there's a girl that comes into his life very briefly, and, and they spend way too much time on her. On her, yeah. And it's really, it's a useless sub- What Directors need to start learning where to trim. Stop mm-hmm. being Peter Jackson, because <laughs> he does it a little better than you guys are doing it. So I, I give it six bucks out of ten. I actually give it a six as well. So, 
It was interesting, but nothing to get super excited about. Well, let's go to box office real quick. Identity Thief, $34.5 million. Huge hit. Melissa McCarthy is a megastar at this point, so expect her to have about 12 sequels to this one and whatever else she comes Well, they already out. got the sequel coming out with Sandra Bullock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> The Heat. Uh, that's coming out this year. And apparently The Heat is going to be rated R movie. I didn't realize. Oh, they had I didn't the Red Band, Red Band trailer f- in front of this one. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh, Warm Bodies held up number two at eleven point three million for a thirty six million dollar total. That's actually really good. Mm-hmm. So you guys so are it's still hot, or is it lukewarm? lukewarm? No, it's pretty hot. <laughs> Side effects, which is Steven Soderbergh's, cons- he says his last film, but he said this like three times in his career. Uh, made nine point three million, which not very good. Seeing Channing Tatum was actually in it, and all of those were. Were women that wanted to just see Channing Tatum, probably. No, no. yeah, probably. <laughs> Silver Linings Playbook, six point four million, still holding on strong. It's eighty nine million. It's going to make a hundred million. Um, and then Top Gun was the other new release, one point nine million. It made a little bit more than Raiders of the Lost Ark when it had its IMAX release. So it was a pretty empty theater. I think we were in the afternoon though too. It's Top Gun. It's from nineteen eighty six. Oh, yeah. well, by the way, um, when we talked about Raiders, I didn't explain it really what it was about, and somebody wrote in about it. So I'm going to say Top Gun is about aviator pilots at the Top Gun school. And Goose Dies. All right, guys, we have got two films that we're going to be discussing this week. Both of them open on February 22nd. The first one is Dark Skies. Uh, This one's a science fiction horror film directed by Scott Stewart and starring Carrie Russell, Josh Hamilton, and Dakota Goyo. Uh, It revolves around a couple trying to save their family from an apparent alien presence who preys on their children. Um, Aaron, as a fellow child predator yourself, uh, do you think that the aliens are trying to horn in on your gig? And if so, does that make you less likely to see this? I don't like that they have the equipment I can't afford. <laughs> I don't appreciate it. I think this looks great. I really do. It, it's, it looks like one of those nice little surprise movies that pop out every now and then where you didn't really know what was coming. You don't know what to expect. Then you see the trailer, you get a little interested, and then you show up at the theater and you see something you weren't expecting. This really intrigues me. Yeah. Even a lot, of, it, a lot of kids see something they don't expect to see when you go to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I don't even know what to say. Scott, say something before I get <laughs> this, this is one of those that I wish I would have just stuck with the original trailer instead of the second trailer that came out more recently. Because I was, I was kind of on board with it, but I... But now that I've seen the second trailer, I feel like I'm, I wouldn't be as surprised as much if I went and saw it in the theater. I saw a little too much in the second trailer. You know, you, I don't know. Maybe I'm alone in that. No, um, I know exactly how you feel. It's like, pissing me off. Yeah, because there's a lot of stuff even in the even in the short trailers on TV that I'm like, man, I wish I would have seen that in the theater for the first time. I've stopped watching it because it's one of those movies I want to be surprised at. That's I wish I would have because I and I didn't like purposely go out and seek it out. I just saw the trailer, you know, before a movie I saw. And <sighs> I I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm going to go. Want to spend the money to see it? Might be it. Might be a rental. It's like you can't stick your finger in your ears and close your eyes and go na 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 na. I could. I'm sorry, Brian. What were you saying? Oh, uh, I was just saying it looks like Paranormal Activity, but with aliens. No, it doesn't. It's not like a shot on camera, random cram- camera. I know like. what he's saying, though. I got, a, I got a, a, a it's, similar it's, vibe. Like everything takes place in their house. There's weird, bunch of weird shit that happens. Yeah. You know. You mean like poltergeist with aliens? <laughs> okay. Maybe, yeah, you could do that too. Mm. I don't like your analogy. Let's try another one. I don't like you. So. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and move on now. Snatch, I mean, Snitch is an action thriller directed by Rick Roman Wah, starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. When a teenage boy is wrongfully arrested for distributing drugs and sentenced to prison for a decade, his father, The Rock, makes a deal with the United States attorney to become an undercover informant and infiltrate a drug cartel, risking his family and his life. Uh, Scotty, that Georgia accent you put on was pretty damn good, so I could easily see you going undercover, uh, perhaps to infiltrate some moonshiners or uh, backwoods meth cookers. Uh, do you want to see this and maybe pick up some tips? <laughs> not, not even a little bit. I just see this. No, 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 no. Do this. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> really? Yeah. No, I don't know there, Justin. I don't think I have any desire to see this movie. It just uh, it just bores me to tears, I tell you. Uh, Do you want to see it in the theater? In the theater. I might go see it in the theater after I see The Hangover. 
<laughs> but uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't need to see The Rock that much. See him kick ass badly enough to go pay money in a theater to see this. So uh, I'm going to pass. All right, bro. <laughs> Brian, what about you? <laughs> see, isn't it flawless? Could he not pass amongst your people? Oh God! Give him, a, give him a mullet now. <laughs> Amongst your people, add him to the uh, tribe. You mean me, uh, me drop look, a clip? I, I won't say a word. Come on down. <laughs> oh, oh, he could be good. his long lost cousin Skeeter. That's right. <laughs> he looks like a Skeeter. A Skeeter. Yeah. I don't know how why he's doing these kind of movies. This just this looks like one of those Steven Seagal Fifty Cent movies. What else is he gonna do? I don't think it doesn't look like an action movie. It looks like a, a really? crime thriller. It looks like the same thing. It looks like faster, except they just stamp another title on it just to make you spend more money. That's possible. That's and faster possible. was disappointing. In, in, in reality, though, what else are you gonna see The Rock? Do you gonna see him do a serious, straight up, straight up drama? I would like to see him do a straight up drama. I think The Rock can actually act when he tries to, when he's not just being Mister Tough Guy. Yeah. You know, I, I like The Rock. He has more charisma than half the actors working today. Yeah, that's a well, charisma fucker. <laughs> I don't think and we've got an you know, episode. The, <laughs> the Rock and, and people like Melissa McCarthy, you know, who are really trying to develop a Hollywood career, sometimes you just have to take the roles that are offered because God knows if you don't, something may happen and you never get another one again. So I don't, I don't blame them for picking up a, a movie that looks a little suspect, but you know, you kind of need the paycheck and you need to keep your name constantly out there. Uh, I don't want to see this, but I don't blame him for doing it. It looks like a contract movie. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you're like, okay, we'll look, we want you on here, but you've got to agree to do three movies for our studio. And so they get a mid level halfway decent script. And they're like, well, we don't, we don't want to put too much into this, but all right, Rock, will you sign up for this? Yeah, I'll go ahead and get this one out of the way. All right, cool. Completely Appreciate agreed. It. Yeah. I, All right, well, of these, I'm sorry, Aaron, did you have something to add? I just I just think it's not going to get a fair shake. I don't think it looks bad. I think, I think the movie, from what I've gathered, is actually a little deeper than what the trailers make it seem. So I'm, I'm still interested. I'm going to wait for reviews, though. I agree with you, but I think it's one of those that you stumble across on, maybe not even stumble. You're like, oh, hey, this one's out on Netflix now. I'll give it a shot. And then we talk about it the next week going, you know, hey, it wasn't that bad. All right. Would you get out of my head? I was about to say the same fucking thing. You can't say it now. Oh, man. Uh, you and like I, are, we're just simpatico, my brother. I'm telling you. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, of these two films, Dark Skies and Snitch, which one are you uh, most likely to go see in theaters, Brian? I'm going to go with Dark Skies. Scotty? Uh, Same for me, Dark Skies. Aaron? Dark Skies. All right, well then, four of us, it is Dark Skies, February 22nd. All right, and you can hear us on iTunes, Zoom, Google your Stitcher radio app, give us a thumbs up if you do, or any RSS feed, as well as rockfordcollegeradio.com, Thursdays from 4 to 6. Uh, what's this movie? What's this movie? Each week we play ours or a listener suggested clip from a movie. And if you think you know what the clip is, email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com or send us a direct message on Twitter at H underscore outsider. And we will announce those that got it correct on the air and give you a proper whole shout out. Last week was Brian's answer and it was the right stuff. Two people mm-hmm. guessed the right stuff. Mm, different, different stuff. Oh, um, it's a different one? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> There was only two people that got it right, Mr. Mister Anyone, who has the best track record, I think, of anybody guessing, and David C. So congratulations, guys. You guys are the ones, the only ones that guessed it, because that was hard as shit. That was not hard as shit. <laughs> not to you, because you loved the movie. To everyone else on the planet, kind of hard. That's what she said. <laughs> this week it is Scott's turn. I'm sorry we're juvenile. This week it is Scott's turn. If you think you know what it is, email us at feedback at the Hollywood Outsider. I don't even know what the fucking email address is anymore. <laughs> Those that guess it correctly. Just keep talking. Nobody's we listening. will give you a whole shout out next week on the show. Here's your clip. Fucking fuckers. <laughs> Go ahead. Skin it. Skin that smoke wagon and see what happens. Oh, yeah, baby. Listen, mister, I'm, I'm getting awful tired of your... <laughs> I'm getting tired of your gas. Now jerk that pistol and go to work. <clears throat> I said throw down, boy. Oh. 
You gonna do something or just stand there and bleed? I'll be your Huckleberry. Sounds like Justin's home videos. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> Maybe oh, if, you'd I love fall, that movie. if you'd fall in line, she wouldn't smack you so hard. Skin that smoke wagon and let's see what happens. God damn, that's good. That is good. I wonder if like whoever wrote it was just like, oh, that is just awesome. They can change everything else in this movie, but that line better fucking stay. He starts pulling on it while he's writing it. Oh my god. Wow. I feel okay. like I was doing it earlier. Okay, let's go to home TV and home video news. God, Justin, what the fuck is wrong with you tonight? <laughs> The Walking, <laughs> the Walking Dead returned with a record-breaking 12.3 million viewers. Holy shit, that is that is amazing for basic cable. Justin, did you catch it? I, my wife and I actually watched it tonight. I did not want to come into this episode not having seen it. So, yeah, we, we've watched it. I also downloaded it on iTunes, so we're a twofer uh, in our family. But, yeah, I mean, it is insane, the uh, the types of numbers that this show is pulling in who would have ever thought Mm -hmm. that a show about the you know a zombie apocalypse would pull in these kinds of numbers but amongst the 18 to 24 age range of adults or well obviously fuck jesus christ of that range this show is is pulling in numbers that are better than Shows like Big Bang Theory, Modern Family, NCIS, those are network institutional shows, and yet they're losing out to this, you know, deep cable show. That's fantastic. I love it. I think this third season of The Walking Dead has been great. I'm so glad that it's back and uh, we can carry on with um, the governor and all that stuff. I, I, it's fantastic. People, please keep watching. Couldn't have said it better myself. I know. <laughs> I, I'm really shocked how every time this show comes back, it's bigger. Yep. I mean, bigger than it was the last time. And it's really, there's nothing amazing about it. I mean, it's a good show. I really love it. But it, it's just weird to me that it's one of these shows that's turned into this water cooler event where people have to see it when it airs. Well, it hits know? a lot of bases. It's got the gore. It's got the character. It's got child characters that they are interesting mm-hmm. or He's got like one child character, well, and he's not that interesting. I keep waiting for him to fall and shoot himself in the head. <laughs> <laughs> he's he, he's growing he really way like too him. fast for this show, by the way. Yeah, I know. Like like three weeks ago, in their according to their timeline, he was kept running outside of the house. So yeah. now suddenly he's like walking around with an Uzi. <laughs> but I mean, this is up six percent from the season premiere, and this is the mid season premiere. You. More people are watching it now than they did when it first when the season started. Mm-hmm. That's insane. Uh, there were people on Facebook like counting down the hours. Like oh, yeah, the there's like hours. a little clicker. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a show that dares to to be different, and because it's on deep cable, they can get away with a lot of things that NBC or Fox could could only dream of trying to do. Hmm. Brian, go. I mean, yeah, I just, I just like I just like the fact that they they don't do things in a procedural way i just you get attached to somebody they die and Mm -hmm. it's and it's not even they don't even do that in a consistent way where so-and-so dies at the end of the season to draw you in for you know the next season or the next half of the season it's they may die in the second episode of the season or it might be the sixth episode of the season half season whatever you want to call it but it's constantly you really never know from one week to the next, who's going to make it? That's, if that's they're going true. to make it, and what's you know, cool is... or, or who they're going to come across if they're going to stumble across a, another farm, or I mean, they're in the prison and stuff now. But I don't, it's it's it doesn't seem to follow many rules, but yet at the same time, it does follow enough of the rules that keeps up that drama. Well, and because they also veered really far uh, a field of the comic book. Even people like me who've read the comic book, we have to keep coming back because this is a, a, a totally different storyline. Nothing is spoiled. Nothing uh, we know is coming will actually be coming. It, it's great to be surprised week in and week out. When you talk about characters might die beginning of the season, whatever, what I like about that is that sometimes you like it, sometimes you don't. You get both ends of it. It's not always like, oh, so-and-so died. Sometimes you're like, yes, that person died. You know Fuck what I mean? You. So you kind of get both ends of the spectrum with that, and I think that's that's actually cool. 
All right, let's move on. Warner Horizon has picked up Red Brick Road, which apparently is being described as the Wizard of Oz, but set in a Game of Thrones type world. Brian, you love Game of Thrones, man. Is this something you want to see? Like Dorothy walking around butt naked on a unicorn? Oh, hell yeah. I didn't well, hear about it. I, you know, I was kind of on the fence about it, but now that you you know kind of bring that into play, kind of along the same lines as the Oliver Twist point, yeah, this change it up a little bit. I, I like this kind of cutting it up, changing it up, flipping it on its lid, making it you know do kind of you take that. I mean, it's just like Smack anything it up, else. Flip it and rub it down. Rub it down. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> 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 I, I like you know a lot of a lot of properties do this or they do this with a lot of different properties you know they've done it with dracula and vampires for the last 50 years or more with you know in movies so why not some of these more sacred uh sacred pieces i'm trying to picture in the game of thrones world to seriously take a guy in a tin man outfit walking around and take that seriously or a guy, a lion. I, I, I don't know. I just can't uh, picture Look at all the other shit that happens maybe, in Game of Thrones. Maybe it's a black kettle pot or something. Maybe he's not in a tin suit with an oil can hat. Yeah, you can make this work. I mean, you could. You just. Well, you definitely could. You modify it. You get imaginative with it. I like it. You start making a little political intrigue. Sure. Give it a shot. I, I want to see this, yeah. Make Oz a power-hungry guy that just wants to you know, bang the Wicked Witch or something and <laughs> take over the other side of Oz or whatever. Yeah, the the, the lion is part of some uh, Saharan desert tribe or whatever. Whatever. Hell yeah. You know, there's, some, it, peaceful, there's some peaceful hippie people. He's not really, you know, but, <laughs> but he just wants to, you know, but he, he wants to, he wants to be brave and that kind of stuff. But he's been raised by a bunch of, uh, you know, granola eaten Twig and berry. Uh, I, don't, I don't know where you're going, Brian, but we're grateful dead. I know where we are, and that's away from whatever the hell you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it does help that lost Carlton Cues will be helping produce it. Shut up. House of, <laughs> <laughs> House of Cards. Justin, what is the House of Cards about? What is it? What it's about? It's fantastic. House of Cards, it's the new show, uh, one of the new shows that Fox, or not Fox, Fox, Netflix is producing on their own to stream over their service. Um, it's it's based on a BBC television show, which is also called House of Cards, which is in turn based on a novel written by someone named Lord Dobbs. Uh, when I read about the British TV show and kind of read its synopsis, it, it, this show strikes really close to what they did uh, over there across the pond. But House of Cards, it's a political drama um it is about a, uh, re a representative, Frank Underwood, played by Kevin Spacey, who is a Democrat from South Carolina. He is the House Majority Whip. And after he gets passed over for a promotion that he thought he was going to get, he decides that he's going to exact revenge on everyone that fucked that up. Uh, along with Kevin Spacey, you've got Robin Wright, who plays his wife. Uh, Kate Mara, who the name may not be familiar, but she's been in a, a lot of stuff. She plays a reporter that he uh, uses to uh, put news out there to help whatever machinations he's got going on. Uh, and then there's another character named Peter, who's another representative that he that kind of gets used throughout the series, played by a guy named uh, Corey Stoll. I'd never really seen him before, but he does an amazing job. Really, everybody involved in this does an amazing job. It's 13 episodes. They're all about 45 to 50 minutes. They're all available right now. You can watch them all in one sitting or at your own pace. What do you guys think? I'm really fucking impressed with this show. I loved it. Well, you guys know me. I'm not a big politics movie guy at all. And you sure I, aren't. And I went into this with an open mind because I had heard good things about it. I'm like in the fourth or fifth episode now, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, Kevin Spacey is outstanding. He, I've told you guys before, I like movies where the main character kind of talks at the camera or you know breaks that fourth wall a little bit. And he does it just the perfect amount in this show. He'll sometimes the, it's just a look. Yep. He might just look at the camera and kind of give you a wistful glance or like a see I told you so kind of look. 
and it's perfect. It's never too much. It's just the right amount, especially the final shot of the first episode. I thought was awesome when when he's uh, in the in the crowd. It, it was it was perfect. The acting's amazing. I'm really interested in the story, and from some of the reviews I've read, it gets it gets rather dark towards the end. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the way it goes. Also, interesting fact: I actually heard about this show today, and this is this is true. Uh, Netflix obviously has the ability to see what shows everybody watches and what movies and mm-hmm. what points you rewind and that kind of thing. This show was created because Netflix found out that people like Kevin Spacey, political thrillers, and David Fincher. And they literally made this show because of those statistics. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of interesting. My favorite uh, th- anecdote that I learned was from Kevin Spacey doing an interview when he said that it's based on a British TV series, I guess. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, it, that's what I said. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Listening. I'm sorry. Well, I'll rewind to welcome, when you welcome repeat. Welcome to the podcast, Aaron. I'll rewind to when uh, <laughs> Justin repeated everything I said and when I mentioned a story earlier, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the the thing I liked, an anecdote he said, was that his, his name, Francis Underwood, is an anecdote to fuck you because F you. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that was, that was pretty it. funny because I never thought of it. Um, I am 11 episodes. I think I just finished the 11th episodes. I've only got two left and holy shit did it get dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, yeah. I'm not sure how I feel about one of the twists yet. And I'll talk about it off here cause I definitely don't want to spoil anything, but everything about the show, I've loved almost every episode. They've even got a couple of what you would consider filler episodes like you would in a normal TV season. Uh, one, you know, where he just visits his alma mater and you just basically learn more about the characters as opposed mm-hmm. to actually propelling the story forward. Um, it, it feels like a, a full TV season. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was really curious walking into this, what it was going to be like, and it doesn't feel any different than any other TV series I've ever watched, except it's better than most of them. So it's really hard to tell anyone don't try this because it's a great show. Kevin Spacey, you know, I mean, he owns the screen like he did in every movie he's ever done with David Fincher. Mm-hmm. And and he just continues to do so. I mean, through the 11 episodes I've seen, phenomenal. And all the other actors are very good, but he's phenomenal. Robin the- Wright surprised me, I think, more than anybody. I'd never seen her in such a kind of a dour, strict character. Normally, you know, she as a woman seems to be so full of life. But this character is in a lot of ways, very empty. And I was shocked by how convincing she was. Oh, and she pulls some stuff too. Oh, <laughs> it, it's, it's really, I mean, it seems real politics. I mean, there's a couple of twists where I, I think, you know, it's obviously going for drama and effect and it's just a TV series, but overall I, I really was very interested in how, how it flowed. Mm-hmm. And this is a show that I want to recommend people just for the, not only for the sheer you fact want to recommend that people, I want to re- recommend people to see this, because I want I want more of this to happen, where entire series are released on Netflix or maybe Amazon or something like that. And, and in most cases, I would recommend it just for that reason. But this is a legitimately good show. Mm-hmm. I'm really impressed with the quality. I'm really impressed with the acting. And it's intriguing. It really kind of makes you want to just start another episode right after the next one, right after one's done. So I, I've been barreling through it. Mm-hmm. So uh, can't recommend it enough. Yeah, and David Fincher, you know, he directed the first two episodes. Joel Schumacher directed a couple. It's like a movie, just a one-hour film. It it does not feel like a TV show at Mm -hmm. all. It's much more dramatic, much more serious, much better than, I think, if they would have tried to do this on a network television channel, it would just be drag. But in Netflix, with that freedom, it's fantastic. I really, really loved it. Yeah, please check it out. Uh, Now let's go to DVD and Blu-ray, Scott. All right, we're looking at the releases for February 19th. First up is Argo. Uh, ben Affleck directs and stars in this dramatization of the Iranian hostage crisis that took place between 1979 and 1980, where the CIA attempts to extract uh, said hostages by staging a fake movie to be filmed in Iran. Aaron and I both saw this when we reviewed it on episode 64. Aaron gave it an 850. I gave it a perfect 10. That was only one of two movies I gave a perfect score last year. Also, Sinister. This one, uh, Aaron and Justin both saw, and we reviewed on episode 64. Uh, Ethan Hawke stars as a writer who is researching a murder and comes across a collection of snuff films depicting the murders that took place in his new home back in the 1960s. Also, and I'm not sure, am I pronouncing this correctly? Anna uh, Karina? Anna Karenia? Karenina? Anna Hor. Karenina. Karenina. (laughs) I don't know what it is. Anna Karenina. It's uh, set in late 19th, 19th century Russia, high society. The aristocrat... 
Anna, whatever her name is, <laughs> enters into a life-changing affair with the aff- affluent Count Vronsky. It stars Kira Knightley and Jude Law. Uh, next up is Fun Size. This is a this is actually the second Nickelodeon film to receive a PG-13 rating, which I thought was kind of interesting. Mm, I thought it was midget porn. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, this one is a teen comedy that follows a high school girl who has to babysit her younger brother on Halloween. Uh, her brother turns up missing, and she has to track him down with the help of two nerd friends from her school. Sounds like nothing that I want to even like get near at all. Liar. Uh, more interesting to me is Battlestar Galactica Blood and Chrome. This was uh, one that Justin talked about a few episodes back. It was originally re- released in short snippets online. Uh, it's the stories of young William Adama during the first Cylon War. So you can actually get that on disc now. Do you remember talking about that? <laughs> or did you sleep through that one too, Justin? No, I remember talking about that. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Game of Thrones Season 2 is going to be coming out on February 19th as well, just in time for Season 3, which airs on March 31st. And with that, we will move on to our next segment. This week, we are recasting the classics. Justin, you want to give a quick rundown before you pass it off to Aaron for us? Sure. Um, this is one of our newer segments. This is where we take a film that's considered a classic, and then we recast four of the actors with modern day uh, actors. You can go as far afield as you want. Just be convincing with your choices. Last week, I told Aaron that I wanted him to recast Alien, and I wanted him to recast specifically the characters of Kane, Dallas, Ash the Android, and of course, Ripley. So Aaron, take her away. All right. Uh, this isn't one of my favorite movies. I like it a lot, but it's definitely more closer to Scott and Justin's heart. So mm-hmm. hopefully I don't mm-hmm. fuck up your dreams. Um, for Kane, my my first pick was James Callis. And he, who is Kane again? Why don't you remind us? You remind for me. Those. I can't remember exactly what he did. He was just the guy that the guy burst out of his stomach. Well, there you go. He's the one who had the <laughs> alien burst out. That's but he, what but most he was, people remember. He was kind of the little whiny bitch of the movie, as far as I'm concerned. So, Brit, so yeah. So I picked James Callis, <laughs> who played uh, Gaius Baltar on Battlestar Galactica. Oh, I, th- oh, I thought he was nice. He reminded me a lot of of James Hurt. Dallas, I didn't want another Tom Skerritt looking old bastard. Was this Jester? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was Jester. <laughs> so I went, I'm going with Helen Mirren. Um, I, I like a little someone also seasoned. You need someone seasoned, yeah. but I think go a different route. I almost went with Judy Dench, but I'm sticking with Helen Mirren. Ash, I mean, a little older than I would have thought, but yeah, because Tom Skerritt was always a spry but cookie, definitely seasoned. Yes, wow. seasoned. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on now, boy. <laughs> For uh, Ash, who's the android, um, I went with Kevin Spacey. Uh, maybe it's because I have watched a ridiculous amount of House of Cards, but also I think he can handle all aspects of that character. Where he, you know, he goes from very straight, very very um, focused to just downright batshit crazy at, at one point. And I so think he did do the voice of the computer on moon. So he can do that kind of there mechanical thing. There you go. And for Ripley. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's all, let's all simmer down. Um, I, I think I, I thought a lot about casting like a younger person. Someone, Jennifer Lawrence. No, not Jennifer Lawrence. That's too easy. <laughs> I thought about casting a guy, but I thought that's been done in every space movie outside of Alien. So that's that's silly. It needs to be somebody that I think is not that well known that can that is very strong, can look very simple. Um, somebody that's not recognizable as a quote unquote hot chick, especially. I'm going with Lena Headey. Uh, from nice. Game of Thrones. Yeah. That's a good call. Yeah. I, okay. I think she can pull off the unrecognizable factor. I think she can make herself look less pretty than she really is because she seems very uh, very modest about her appearance. She's she's fine doing whatever. Mm-hmm. I, but I think, she's uh, strong enough and, and kind of – she's got enough strength to her to pull off the tough girl aspect also. Yes. And if you saw Dread, she – there are moments where she seems very fragile and weak, and then she snaps right and just becomes a vicious fucker. And that's, I thought that was a perfect shot for her. Yeah, and she was really tough in the Sarah Connor Chronicles. Mm-hmm. So that's that's my choice. Choice says. Wow, is. inspired. I'm, yeah, I'm really, I'm really digging it. And Scott, you're next. So oh. in two weeks, Musical. you get to, you get to recast a movie. That's two weeks from now. Uh-huh. Okay. Jurassic Park. Oh. In honor of its 20th anniversary, so it just makes the cut. <laughs> um, I want you to cast Dr. Alan Grant, mm-hmm. Dr. Ellie Sattler, mm-hmm. Dr. Ian Malcolm, who's Jeff Goldblum, and John Hammond. All right. Can you handle that? I can. And don't cast that 
stupid bastard that uh, stole the serum and fell down and got killed by the <laughs> oh the guy uh, uh, uh. New- Newman Newman uh, uh, uh. Newman not him. <laughs> you didn't say the magic word. Yeah. Hold and- on to your butt. <laughs> Now let's go to our from the outside in topic. This might cause a little far. Uh, Rex Reed, he's a movie critic who's an asshole. He's gotten into a lot of hot water for his recent review of Identity Thief, where he referred to star Melissa McCarthy as hippo and tractor sized in the in the review. Um, one thing I want to point out: he has released a a backstep of his own and explained that the reason that he used those words were because. He doesn't like the kind of comedy where they, they intentionally poke fun at her weight. I've seen the movie. They hardly do any of those kind of jokes. It's more about her character. It's not about her weight or the fact that she's overweight. Doesn't he call her Frodo? That's a yeah. small person. Yeah. I mean, th- there's all kinds of shit, and I don't even remember any real weight jokes. Mm-hmm. So I, it's just a total – he's just, he's just chicken. and He's a chicken shit. But anyway, first off, what the hell is that about? I mean, that, there's no place, no reason that that should have existed to begin with. Justin, you can go first because I know you want to. Well, first off, Rex Reed, I really hope that you're listening to this because I, I, I want you to understand, you know, how we here at the Ho feel about this issue, and and I really want you to suck my dick. <laughs> you're a fucking asshole, and you there is no justification, none at all, for saying the things about her that he said. Tractor sized. Female hippo. There, I don't care. He wants to try and say that my point was that I object to using health issues like obesity as comic talking points. Fuck you. It's not your place to sit there and poke fun at her for her health issues because you're tired of people that maybe you knew died of obesity related problems you can have all the issues you want but a review is not a place for you to sit there and use the kind of language that you use to describe her and of course he also had to say that what he said is constitutionally protected so there's nothing anybody can do no there actually isn't and as much as i hate what you say you do have the right to say it but we all also have the right to tell you to suck our dicks because you're an asshole and whatever issues that you've got with obesity problems in this country, I'm you are well, you know, you can have them. I'm glad. And in a lot of ways, I can agree because obesity is a problem in this country. I am a prime example of it. But this is not an opportunity to sit there and call her the things that you called her. Instead of approaching her with love and sympathy and wanting to encourage her to live a better lifestyle, you go ahead and act like a goddamn third grader pulling out the kind of names that you'd hear on a damn schoolyard. It's ridiculous. And I really wish he would lose his job over it because a company that's going to keep someone like him and their employee to write what he wrote. I, I would not want him associated with me at all. He's free to write it on his own blog. And if he wants to go at his, him, go it alone and write those sorts of things, fine. But when he's writing for a company in a review, he is speaking for them in a certain regard. I fucking hate it. He's a son of a bitch. And I hope that this goes some way towards ending his ass, you know, of a career. Unfortunately, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I really think there's no excuse for it. There, there's just no excuse for it. I, I don't mind when, when writers want to talk about the kind of comedy that they have a problem with or they don't like dick and fart jokes because I've talked about that many times. If you're not into that kind of comedy, fine. If you don't like jokes about someone's weight, there are other ways to say it than referring directly to someone's character or someone's appearance, which is exactly what he did. He wasn't referring to any kind of joke. If you read the review, which I have, he very much refers to Melissa McCarthy as, or, or her character, however you want to see it, as tractor-sized and a hippo. And whether you think obesity is gross or you think um, overweight people are nasty, whatever it is you think, it doesn't make it okay. Because I don't care what you think. And, and it's not fair to degrade people. I mean, it, it would be – if they did this about a black guy or – Right, called him the N-word. Yeah, or a – Well, he's a, the character. You know, well, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't, even, you, wouldn't even have, you wouldn't even have to go that far with it. You could just – A retarded kid. Other slur. You know, if you did a review and you said you called a kid a retard, everybody would be all over it. All over it. And if you – you just can't I, – I don't understand why obesity, it's okay. Like he's not losing his job over this because it's not like us where we're, you know, doing it for free. 
And, you know, we're we're a pretty irreverent podcast and whatever. He's supposed to be a respected film critic that people look to for film reviews and, and pointers on what to see. And he also influences a lot of people. And that influence is making fun of other people. And even if it is just this review, it's one too many times to say it. So that said, um, what what kind of personal baggage do we bring to a movie uh, about maybe actors or, or directors? When we see it, you know, it just turns us off. It's really hard for us to overcome it. Scotty? Yeah, you, you, you probably spoke to it here, uh, you know. Any, anytime you throw religion stuff in there, I get I get kind of turned off, and I turn a nose up to it a little bit. What so, do you, What do you mean by religion stuff? Do you mean something like stigmata, or do you mean something like no, no, not something like stigmata? Because uh, I think that I think religious imagery in horror movies is actually interesting, like because it, it, it portrays it as dark. So for that on on that token, it you know I, I might have a more positive view on that than someone else that that doesn't, you know. But something like but something ex- like courageous, where it has a yep. religious overtone. Yeah, I, I have no, absolutely no interest in that. That's that's. I, I knew someone that like forced their kids to go see that movie you know, because of because of this this awesome message, and that just made me not even want to have anything to do with it. So, I haven't seen the movie, so you know, I can't. Do you know review. what the message was? Uh, no. What was the message? I don't know. It was courage, uh, courage, I family. Don't know. Courage. Family values, mm-hmm. stuff like that. But I don't, I don't need religion to tell me to do that. Is my point. So with that said, that you throw stuff in like that, it's not going to be fair for me to review a movie like that because I, I'm, I'm obviously not going to like it. Anything Kirk Cameron does these days. That, that was where I was. <laughs> I, I, I don't need to, to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a topic that when you see it, you have a hard time yeah. getting we need over to circumvent it. their intellect. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, the way you, you phrase this question, though, um, is that, you know, when reviewing or telling friends about a film, what should be off limits? For me, the things that should be off limits are the things that maybe the film didn't do. A lot of times people want to mark down a film or a TV show because they think, well, it should have done this or it should have done that. To me, you discuss it on what it did, discuss it on the, on the things that it brought to the table. You know, don't bring a whole lot of expectations and then get mad when it doesn't go the ways you think it should have gone or do the things you think it should have done. Mm-hmm. Base your reviews and your thoughts off of what it actually did. I, I can't stand it when, when people, go on and on about well i just wish it had done this that or the other well it didn't so well, I, that's not I, even an with, issue. I would agree with you to a certain extent but if if they market it in a certain way and they lead you to believe that Absolutely. i'll give i'll give a cable guy an example that movie was marketed and the, the trailers and everything were made it look like a kind of a slapsticky typical jim carrey movie when it's actually a dark comedy Right. So you're you're thinking hilarious Ace Ventura antics, but you're getting more uh No talking out his butt. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you're getting more of what what was the uh the bachelor party in Vegas one with Jeremy Piven and uh it was, Oh, it was a really dark, dark comedy with Cameron Diaz. Oh, bad, bad things. Bad, bad, very, very, very bad things. Very bad, very bad, things, bad yeah. things. Thank you. There Thank you go. You. Sorry sorry for the drag there, but yeah, it's you know it's closer to that than it is Ace Ventura, and I think that was one of the reasons why it really kind of bombed was people going there thinking that they're getting silly, and it was a little silly, but it was really kind of a dark comedy more than it was the crazy Ace Ventura style. I'm, so when you do, I guess all of that to say, kind of come back to my point where you. You know, when you say it doesn't do something, I think that that kind of calls for pointing out what it didn't do instead of just saying, well, hey, it was, yeah, it was funny and Matthew Broderick was hilarious, but. I hear you. I agree. I got a bold one. Uh oh. (laughs) Oh, It's going to sound like I'm, and it's going to sound like I'm uh, pointing fingers and I probably kind of am. But I think when, when people automatically discredit a movie because they don't agree with, a director's or producer's or actor's politics or how what they do outside of their filmmaking 
Mm, yeah, I can agree to an extent, but it's f- for me. It, there's it depends on on how I guess how much I either disagree with their outside of the arts antics. And you know where I'm going with that. I'm not trying to stir up an argument with or you. Or not, but the Ted Nugent. I don't. I I I hate Ted Nugent, but. I don't hate him so much that I'm going to stop listening to Stranglehold. That's a fucking fantastic song, and I'm not going to hate it. But Orson Scott Card, fuck him, fuck his books, fuck that upcoming movie. I won't put one penny in his coffers because of the the amount of effort he's put into oppressing the uh, homosexual part of our society he has made blog post after blog post statement after statement he has put money into oppressing these people and when you go that far into pushing your feelings on the rest of us then fuck you and everything you're involved with i won't i will not watch ender's game the film even though i enjoyed the book when i read it many years ago before i knew how he felt about how you know the things he feels so fuck him but it really depends on how much they push it if it's just they mention it in an interview and i don't agree well all right but if you're going to pour money into it and you're going to campaign for it then you've taken it beyond the arts and you've really made it a cause and then no i won't i won't watch your shit i won't help you succeed yeah, I don't know what to say after that. <laughs> was that what you meant, Scott? Yeah, was that yeah kind absolutely. Of where you were going? Yeah, like All I right. said, I wasn't trying to stir a debate. I just, I, I think why not? Be because I don't like to debate. <laughs> but I, I, like Aaron said it a couple of weeks ago when we talked about it. You know, I, I can I can separate the two very well, and and that's that's a book that is very beloved to me, and that's not going to keep me from from seeing the movie. So. Okay. You're a bad person. You are. He is kind of a bad person. All right, let's go on to emails. Justin, you got an email. Uh, this one's from David C. He says, the answer is the right stuff. Uh. Also, I was surprised by the fact that in your review of Warm Bodies, nobody mentioned the references to Romeo and Juliet. Between the characters named, uh, between the characters' names, R and Julie, the two sides at war that don't approve of the relationship and the blatant reenactment of the balcony scene, which got a huge eye roll from me. I thought it was a bit heavy handed. I'm curious what you guys thought of those references and if how it affected your opinion of the movie. I personally enjoyed the film quite a bit overall, but feel like I could have enjoyed the romance aspect of the film a lot more if I weren't hit over the head with the references quite so much. Thoughts? Uh, I mentioned that in my uh, upcoming attractions of warm bodies but i really didn't think to mention it much during the review though I, we should have it mm-hmm. i should not have left that out yeah i mean the entire time i'm watching it i i recall that the romeo and juliet elements are going to be all through it 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 didn't bother me uh, even the uh balcony scene that, that he references cheesy. didn't bother me that much i, I actually thought it was kind of cute because they you know, he they didn't do that, you know, hark by, you know, yonder window breaks, it is Juliet sort of stuff. It was much more modern and, and take on it. So and it, it, certainly I didn't feel like the, the zombie and human element of their love paired up all that tightly with the uh, Capulet and Montague family feud in Romeo and Juliet there even I mean it wasn't really until the end when her father kind of found out that they were in a relationship that even got some real oh what's the word I'm looking for um conflict with their relationship it's not like the zombies are gonna go dude what are you doing that's (laughs) she's one of them that that so no it didn't I didn't feel hit over the head with it it and that's probably why I forgot to even mention it yeah, I I kind of feel the same way. Although I do think that the balcony scene was a bit cheesy. It was it was a little cheesy. Yeah, a little cheese is all right though, for but me. I, but I mean, it was it was it was down to the script almost without saying the actual words of that scene. I mean, right. you've got someone in the back room yelling at Juliet. She's trying to be quiet. He's down at the bottom trying to hide, not being seen. You know, I mean, it was it was very much in your face, but not enough to ruin the movie for me or. or or lessen my my enjoyment of it. And the movie did not end the way Romeo and Juliet ends. No. I mean, no, no spoiler, but 
th that element was, did not carry over. Well, no I, poisonings. I didn't see it, David, so I can't speak to it. All right, let's go to well, let's let's end it. Let's just let's just end it. Just shoot stick it. Stick a fork in it. Stick in a fork in it. Let's done. just go. Remember to enter our Oscar prediction contest. You can win prizes. Details are on the website. Email us your predictions by February twenty fourth at six p.m. to the Hollywood. I'm sorry, to the Outsider at the Hollywood with the subject line "I'm an Oscar Ho" to be entered to win. Categories are in the show notes and on the website. You can find hey, us. When are, we, when are we doing our picks? Next week. Next week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Make sure to stay through the credits for outtakes. Go to thehollywoodoutsider.com for more details. Facebook.com forward slash thehollywoodoutsider. Email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Tell your friends. Subscribe on iTunes, Zoom, Google Reader. Listen to your Stitcher radio app. Give us a thumbs up if you do. Or any plain old RSS feed. As well as rockfordcollegeradio.com Thursdays from 4 to 6. Thanks for being here, Brian Williams. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Yeehaw. Justin McCumber. Hey, man, Rex Reed, I hope you get fired and lose your job. Die. <laughs> Fuck off. It's a great economy. I hope you're living in it soon. Get ass cancer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, Scott Clark. Y'all come back now, you hear? And <laughs> Scott also did a recent guest spot on Destination Asphyxiation where he talked about video games. His mic wasn't that wonderful, but, you know, it was, it was a pretty interesting conversation, so be, feel, be sure to check that out. And remember, the next time you go to a theater, buy popcorn. I know the chorus. Where are you going, going, baby? Hey, I, I just met you. And this is crazy. So here's my number. So call me, maybe. You had a tweet that said, Life's too short to date girls with curfews. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because basically you sign on and it just randomly, you know, attaches you to somebody to chat to. I saw more guys jerking off than I ever wanted. Like what the that's what? That's all it was. Those guys I, like having yeah, videos of themselves jerking off. It's just well, here's it's just what nothing but dudes. I want to know how long jerking. Scott listened to it or watched it. Well, how much jerking off did you want to see? If that was more than you ever wanted to. <laughs> that kind of implies there was a certain amount of desire pre-existing. <laughs> Uh, I can four... handle a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> 45 minutes of it was just way too much. <laughs> My wife wanted me to tell you guys that you have officially ruined any Ice Age movie for her ever, because she can't hear the words Ice Age without thinking pedophile drift. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> What's that say about your wife? Mm, how's that feel to be like a kept man? Oh, Is man. that cool? Kind of oh, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You tell someone to chive, and I, like you're gonna think I'm lying, but I don't even look at it for the chicks. I think you're lying. Exactly. <laughs> you are correct. You are a liar. <laughs> <laughs> no. I... This fucking don't get mad at me, bitch. <laughs> I hope you fall asleep on this thing. <laughs> I just hear <laughs> how does Southern snore? <laughs> yeah, how do you snore with an accent, <laughs> y'all? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.